Thank you. I want to thank uh, Largo High School for having me today. Uh, I call him Scott. I guess you know him as uh, Mr. Kaplan. I appreciate him uh, giving me the opportunity uh, to speak to all of you about a passion of mine. I'm going to talk to you uh, today about a passion of mine, and not only is it a passion, but it is my profession. I am a podcaster. And so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the life of a podcaster, how to become a podcaster, some of the pluses and minuses, and maybe even uh, inject some funny stories about the last seven years of me doing my podcast, even though the topic that I cover uh, is very, very serious. So this is my podcast I found. It's on my shirt as well. You can find it on iTunes, Spotify, any podcast platform out there. And I also have a YouTube channel. I'm on TikTok, I'm on Instagram, all the social media sites. But mainly, it is all based on the uh, audio episodes that come out every Friday at 2 p.m. So, next slide. So I'm just gonna call this Podcasting 101. And I'm gonna, like I said here, I'm gonna talk a little bit about life of a podcaster. I'm gonna talk about concept, we're gonna talk about writing, we're talking about recording. And ultimately, can you make this a career? You should know I do this as a career for over seven years. It is my only job. It is my full-time job. So as for me, whoops, give you a little bit of my bio. Uh, I am a missing persons podcaster. I cover nothing but missing persons cases. Don't cover murders, I don't do serial killers or uh, UFOs or anything like that. I specialize in missing persons uh, cases that are unsolved. When I get to them, they are unsolved. And Right now, I'm getting about over 1 million downloads a year, which is pretty good for what I would call a very niche or niche podcast, a uh, very, very particular topic, uh, not a, not a, uh, you know, like a general topic type of coverage that you might expect with true crime, which is the genre that I'm in. The, with the way I go about things is I find out about missing persons cases, and I try to find family and friends uh, who knew the missing person, and then I interview those people. I record that interview, and then it plays on my podcast that comes out every Friday. I kind of set it up, uh, me talking by myself for a while, and then the interview plays. Sometimes those interviews can be over two hours. That is not unusual. Sometimes I break it up into multiple episodes. But that is what I do, and not only just speaking to you, this is actually the first time I've spoken to uh, high schoolers, but over the past couple years I've been all over Florida speaking to universities, uh, at universities, speaking to criminal justice majors, people who are eventually maybe going to be in the FBI, maybe going to be uh, a sheriff somewhere, so they can have some knowledge about what goes on out there in disappearances because they don't get that otherwise. So I'm just not a podcast, I've kind of been a little bit of an educator and a whole bunch of other things put together. Some of my other bio, I've actually testified in a murder trial twice out in the state of Colorado due to the work uh, that I did back in 2019. The first trial ended up in a hung jury in 2021. So, and then 2022, they called me back. I went out to a place called Greeley, Colorado where I had to get up on the stand and ask, answer questions from both, both the prosecution and the defense. Uh, like I said, the first trial was hung jury. The second trial, uh, a guy, his name is Steve Pank, he was convicted in the 1984 murder of a girl named Janelle Matthews. And maybe I'll get into this a little bit later, but I'm actually now communicating with this killer, Steve Pank, in jail, and he's in there for the rest of his life. But I'm kind of becoming writing back and forth and trying to kind of probe his mind and everything. I've been featured on 48 Hours Twice, if you're familiar with that TV show, twice because of my work on the Steve Pank trial. And over the past, over seven years, over 400 episodes I've produced 
of my podcast. It got started on the first Friday of September of 2016. It is a weekly podcast and that comes out to about over 400 episodes. I've only ever missed three Fridays in over seven years. Yes, that's a lot of work. Uh, 311 disappearances featured. Of those 311, just recently I went back and was counting uh, how many of those have been solved since Unfound's coverage. Only 28. It's a very low number, that's about 9%. Would like it to be a lot higher, but disappearances, trying to solve them, especially ones that are very old, going back to the 80s, 70s, 60s, very, very difficult, but we give it our best shot every week, and in 2024, maybe you can be looking for me on TV. I've already done one TV show where they've interviewed me, and I don't know how they'll edit it and everything, but I'll be on that one, and then another one is coming up in December where I'll be showing up, and they'll be interviewing me, and that will come out sometime in 2024, all based on, in particular, this one case from 2019 where I testified twice. So that's my bio. Uh, outside of that, uh, just to give you a little bit of my background, I'm not originally from Florida, I'm actually from Pennsylvania. I lived in Las Vegas for over 13 years. I was involved in entertainment. I say all of this because a lot of this background certainly helps when you become a podcaster. We're gonna get into writing and some other things, but certainly a performing background helps. I was a musician for a long time. I was an actor in Las Vegas. Uh, uh, a, uh, an attraction that's not there anymore called Star Trek The Experience. All of this helps, especially when you're doing public speaking and when writing and recording a podcast. So this is uh, actually, I've just this year started a, uh, a course on teaching called How to Podcast Better Than Anyone. That's supposed to be me. I, I don't claim to be the greatest artist. That was made in Canva. But I actually am now helping other people out there in the world uh, make their own podcasts at teachable.com as well, when I have the time. So the life of a podcast, we're just going to do some pluses and minuses. Pluses, you make your own hours. Now that can be good and uh, that can be bad. Because it's not unusual for me to be working on a Friday night, Saturday night, but then on the other hand, I might not be working on a Wednesday at all, it just depends. So you get to make your own hours, but um, sometimes you find yourself working 70, 80 hours a week because you want to turn that podcast out. You don't want to miss, uh, you don't want to let your audience down, I guess you could uh, say. I have no boss. Uh, I don't answer to anyone but myself, although the audience uh, is certainly my boss. Of course, if people stop tuning in, if I see the downloads that are going down, uh, then maybe that's a bad sign. But all the quality, the writing, everything, I'm responsible for it. And there's a lot of freedom uh, that can come from that if you are disciplined enough. Uh, a lot of people start, start podcasts. You should know it's very unusual for a podcast to last over seven years. Very, very unusual. It's go on to iTunes or other places, you'll find podcasts that came out, they existed for maybe a few months, maybe a year, but all of a sudden the host stopped making them, who knows what uh, ever reason, but it's not as easy as it looks because some people, they say they don't like a boss, but some people sometimes need a boss to be motivated. So there's a lot of uh, self-motivation that you have to have to become a podcaster. You control everything. I do everything for my podcast. A lot of it has been on the job training. I had no experience in audio recording before I started my podcast. But I got a, um, a MacBook, started messing around with the program GarageBand, and eventually I figured it all out. I wouldn't say that I now use everything that GarageBand has to offer, but enough for me to get my podcast done, and uh, I think it comes out really well. The big thing about what I do, especially when you're interviewing people, either over Zoom or just over your cell phone, audio quality is a big deal. And probably to this day, seven years in, I still sometimes get audio quality complaints. Uh, sometimes people's cell phones just don't work as well as you'd like, and you just have to do uh, the best with it. You can learn about that, and you can figure out kind of afterwards 
how to make it so everybody can understand what your guest is saying. But I control everything, including the marketing. Uh, anything you'll see on Twitter, or what do they call it, the X now, or TikTok, or whatever, I create all of that. So I'm, uh, I have to be a master of a lot of things. Now there are other podcasts that maybe they're co-hosts, maybe they're four or five people putting a podcast together, and maybe they can split up the jobs. But for me, I've just learned to do everything, and I think it's worked out uh, pretty well. And, and trust me when I say that seven years ago, I could have never guessed that I would have a podcast that was such a niche kind of podcast that was getting over a million downloads a year. I could have never guessed that. And there are a lot of things that I did early on that showed that I didn't think I was going to be around very long, and now I'm still here. Of course, with being a podcaster, it gives you an opportunity to be as creative as you want. What motivates you? What kind of creativity motivates you? What kind of writer are you? What kind of speaker are you? Of course, I created the, the logo. Uh, you can see on my shirt, it was up at the beginning. I created the logo. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to get into art, all sorts of different things. You are creating something from nothing. So I, to me, that's a big plus. I'm a very creative person. I've always been a creative person. And uh, it changes people's lives, at least for what I do. Of course, you, you pick something that's maybe not as serious as what I do then maybe that change people's lives, maybe that's a little bit of a different definition. But for me, I, I, I never could have guessed, uh, you know, 10 years ago, that I would affect as many people's lives as, lives as I had as I have. I could have never predicted that. And not just the people here in Florida, I cover disappearances all over the United States, and in fact, I think we're almost in all 50 states now. I've covered a disappearance in Africa, covered many disappearances in Canada, I, I covered a disappearance uh, in New Zealand, I covered the disappearance of maybe you've heard of Flight 370, that jet from several years ago that disappeared. I uh, covered that uh, disappearance, so technically I guess that's Malaysia. And all these people, all these families, they always come back and thank me. And uh, it's very rewarding, probably more rewarding than anything else, even though I do get paid to what, uh, for what I do, and I've been featured on TV and everything else, but still the number one thing is hearing these people who have had things happen to them that you wouldn't wish upon your worst enemy. It's just horrible, to not knowing what happened to their loved one. Even if that loved one is found, uh, probably deceased, they are never the same. Never. And so that I try to help them out in some way. And I have no disappearances in my family. I came to this from a very different point of view. I've always been interested in mysteries, disappearances, going back to when I was a little kid way, 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 way back in the 1970s. And um, like I said, never could have guessed that I would have people thanking me from Ireland and Australia for the work that I did. Could have never and it is fun. Now, I, it's not Disney World fun. It's not like going to Disney World or maybe Busch Gardens since we're in the Tampa area. It's not like that. Um, but I do enjoy helping these people. And this is something that you can experience as well, no matter what topic you may pick if you choose to get into podcasting. But it's not exactly fun like going to an amusement park. But I do find it enjoyable. I am, um, I've just found that for me, with the work that I do, the topic that I've chosen, that it goes along with my mind. Don't ask me to manage people. I, I had a job like that several years ago where I managed a convenience store. I was horrible. All I had was like three or four employees under me, and I could not manage them at all. Schedules and everything, forget it. But you give me a lot of ideas, and I'm very good at managing ideas and cataloging them, you have to find you have to look at yourself very honestly and figure out what are your strengths. If you want to be into podcasting, what are your strengths? It's very important. So moving on. If this is going to work. Minuses. Highly speculative. Uh, I, there are only a very, very, very small percentage of people who get into podcasting that actually get, make money at it enough to actually live on it. Like I said, I'm very fortunate in that, even though I have a very niche podcast, a 
it's not like video games or which, you know, have wide, it can get 10 million, 100 million downloads a year. I'm very fortunate for what I do that I am able to make money as a career doing it. But this is very unusual. It's no different than if you want to become an actor or a rock star or something like that. There's a lot of money to be made, but or pro athlete. It's like one in a hundred thousand chance of doing this. But still, if you hit it right, it can be very rewarding for you. But get into this, it can be highly, highly speculative. Of course, minus also, when you're in control of everything, if you don't do it, it doesn't get done. If you don't have a, a co-worker, or maybe here at school you're working on other with other students on a project, or you think you can just lay back and let the other people do it, in podcasting, it's not like that. Even if you are working with others, you're going to be required you know, to put up uh, your side of the deal. For me, I have nobody else. If I don't do it, the podcast doesn't get done. And like I said before, I've only missed three Fridays in over seven years, which has to be some kind of record. So it's a lot of pressure, and uh, I'm a really laid back guy. But in my life, I will tell you, the time I get the most stressed out is when I start wondering, am I gonna get an interview done uh, in time for the podcast to come out on Friday. Nothing else in my life really stresses me out at all. But that does stress me out because I don't like missing Fridays. You gotta be prepared for a lot of criticism. Uh, this is a story made kind of, it's funny now, it wasn't funny at the time, but when I got started in September of 2016, you cannot imagine the bad reviews that I got. It was horrible. And, and probably, uh, there was a little bit of trolling going on some of it probably was well deserved too, but you really have to have what they call rhino skin. You have to be able to deal with that criticism because within all that criticism that you may get, actually one of those, one or two of those people may be telling the truth. Now you have to know yourself well enough to say, well, all these people over here are full of crap, but this person, that person, maybe they have a point. But you really, really have to be ready for that. And you can't um, blow up at these people. You cannot respond to these people. You have to let it go. That's something uh, that I learned. And really what I tell people now, people who I help with their podcasts, is that I tell them to not read reviews at all. It's not important. If you believe that uh, you're meant to do this, then what people say about you and the work that you've done does not matter. All that matters is that you feel good about what you're doing and you feel that you are um, you know, giving your audience what it deserves, the highest quality of podcast uh, that you can. That's all that matters. At some point, you just don't review the, uh, look at the reviews anymore. In fact, even though my podcast is on iTunes, I haven't been on iTunes because iTunes, of course, where I get most of the reviews, at least that's what I've been told. I haven't been on iTunes in years. I don't, I don't even go there anymore. I just upload it. I don't care what people say. I'm here to help out the families. I'm here to educate people. That's why I'm here. Uh, opinions don't matter. It is more work than it appears. Maybe you are listening to some podcasts on whatever topic right now. Trust me, the host is putting in more work probably than you could ever realize to bring that audio program to you. A lot of, um, there's like this, um, what is an analogy of like, if you see a duck on the water and it's moving around, it's so smooth and everything, but it's paddling like heck uh, under the water. That's kind of what podcasting is like. When people see me uh, out in public, it looks so laid back and everything, yeah, behind the scenes, in my mind, my podcast is always on my mind about what I gotta do next, always. So you can't leave, uh, it's not like a lot of jobs out there where you can just leave it. You know, you're done nine to five, and you're done. And you don't have to work on weekends. You're podcasting 24-7. It's always on your mind, which could be a minus. You never get to put it to the side. And to be honest, even though I've taken some time off, but I don't take what we might call vacations. I work on my podcast. I've worked on my podcast every day since September of 2016. So even though I've gone here, I've gone there, I bring all of my equipment with me, my microphone, my stand, my everything. I bring it with me no matter where I go. In addition, it can get a little repetitive. Uh, I've told people that um, it's a little bit like being on the assembly line. We're doing the same thing over and over again. And if 
You've seen the movie Groundhog Day. It can be a little bit like that. Um, but for me, the way I've used that to my benefit is it's allowed me to really educate myself about disappearances to help others. You have all this experience doing the same thing over and over and over. You start to know what you're talking about at some point, and you become more than just a podcaster. Next slide. Now, as far as concept goes, this is probably the most important thing that if you're thinking about, if you ever think about getting into podcasting, this is the number one thing. It must be something you like. Do not follow fads. The reason I got into missing persons podcasting is because I've been interested in them in missing persons for a very, very, very long time. And then the technology just caught up to like where I was in my life and I started doing the podcast. Don't follow fads. The podcast has to be an expression of you, not of somebody else, not what you think other people are going to like. My idea when I started my podcast was I'm going to create a podcast that I would, li I would listen to if I was out there in the audience. All right, that's, I just do it to please me, even though I'm helping people. That's what's going to get you through those tough times when you don't feel like recording today or trying to do an interview. It's going to be, well, this is me. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. In contrast to trying to chase the fads, because once you get your podcast up and running, the fad may have already changed. So it has to be an expression of you. It has to be something you really like. Uh, some people, of course, have an ex uh, do a podcast as an extension of the job they have. There are lawyers out there who do podcasts about lawyer stuff. Doctors, engineers, and those can be very successful. Of course, that could be on the side. Although today, um, some of those people can make as much money doing podcasting as they do with their regular jobs, especially if like, they're on YouTube. But some people use podcasting as an outlet for whatever work they end up doing as a career. And that can be sort of successful. I can't really relate to that because I do my podcast full time. But it is certainly a possibility. Like I said, it should be something that will make you record when you don't feel like it. Writing. This is also an important part. This is the, also the hardest part of podcasting. Recording is not the hardest part. Writing is the hardest part. Uh, luckily for me, I have an extensive, extensive, extensive writing background going back to like when I was your age. I love to write kind of a hermit even at my age now, and so me sitting in a computer writing words just goes right along with my personality, and you may have to be the same way to do a podcast. And the writing is what makes your podcasting good, not the recording. It's also do not blow off those creative writing courses that you have here in school or if you go to college, not blow them off. You should take at least one. In fact, I would tell anybody in any who's thinking about going to engineering, accounting, something where you don't think you have to write too much, you should take a writing course. Writing is something, and I don't mean like hand typing, it's always going to be relevant to anything you do in your life. But especially for podcasting, everybody thinks it's just audio, it's more writing than recording. I can't tell, I, I can do the recording side of my podcast in a couple hours, whereas I will spend hours writing, editing, making sure that I get every word right before I ever come to the microphone. Uh, I also have to just not, uh, do not just turn on the microphone and think you'll be good. I think this was uh, the guy who was in here before me, the guy from the uh, Tampa Bay Lightning, was actually happened upon this just as I walked in. Um, that just don't take for granted that you're going to be interesting just because your friends think you're funny and you think you're smart and everything else. You have to prepare. Uh, I've, I've listened to some podcasts where guys just think, well, we're going to get on here and we're just, we're just naturally funny. Nobody wants to hear that. This is no different than if you were to see a uh, stand-up comedian. Before you ever see him or her on YouTube or you actually go to a performance live or whatever else, that person has spent hours and hours and hours working on their material, writing, 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 before they ever appear in front of you. It's kind of the same thing with podcasting. This is what's going to make your podcast good or not. The writing, not the recording. The writing. Keep that in mind. 
recording, this is the public product. This is the end product. This is how people are going to uh, identify you. You make your podcast. They're not going to think about the writing and everything else. They're going to they're going to think of you of what they hear. This though is the easiest part. Like I just said, uh, when I at least for the podcast that I do that spend hours writing, especially when I do interviews, I do them through outlines. What I will do is I will accumulate all the information. It's very rare, very weird, very weird how I go about it compared, I think, to a lot of other podcasters in any genre. I'll collect all the information from the person at first, then I will put together an interview outline, which takes hours because I wanted to get it just right. Then I will interview that person following that outline. They'll have the outline, I'll have the outline, and we'll follow it. I can tell you some of those outlines take four or five hours to create, and that's before you even record it with the person. That takes a couple more hours. Whereas I can record my part where I'm just speaking for my podcast in less than an hour. So, it's, uh, so this is why I said recording is the easiest part. Equipment, overrated. I'm using a microphone uh, for my podcast that I'm sure is older than any of you. I think I got that microphone back in about 2004 or something, 2005, something like that. Now the computers I have that I use a MacBook and I have a Dell F2 um, are much newer. But as far as everything else, it's pretty old. But still, it just sounds like people who've just gotten a microphone here or other equipment in 2023. Equipment is overrated. You can do a podcast on your phone if you want it. Just record it right into your phone and then upload it to some website or wherever. You can do it that way. Can't do it really for the, what I do because of the seriousness of the topic. But if you have a topic that's a little more laid back, maybe it is actually fun like video games or something like that, then you probably could just use your phone and record it, upload it somewhere where everybody can hear it. Equipment is overrated, recording booths. I've heard of stories of uh, people getting, you know, doing, you know, broadcasting, recording like in a closet and they have this sound deadening material. I don't do any of that. Uh, and I don't think that anybody knows the difference. I think once again, it's overrated. I just sit right down at my table that's right in the middle of my condo and start recording. When I live down in Madeira Beach, same thing. I live maybe within 50 feet of a busy street in Madeira Beach, never factored into the recording at all. People never heard the background noises at all. Overrated. It's very easy. Authenticity is more important than perfection. People have to know that when you are doing recording, it's you. It's not some character. Now, it may be you want to create a character like some comedians, other people do. But if you're going to do a, a topic, maybe like what I'm doing, you can't be a character. You have to be authentic. People care way more about authenticity than perfection. Episode length, I'm notorious for having long episodes. Uh, because I will interview people as long as it takes to cover a disappearance. And I've started kind of chopping them up like into two-hour sections. But for a long time, it was not unusual for me to have episodes that went three or four hours. And that's how I would upload it. But it's up to you. Now, you know, some marketing person will tell you, well, you got to uh, make it under an hour. That's what people want. Uh, I'm not a big believer in that. Those people, those kinds of people aren't doing your podcast. They'll happily take over your podcast as if they started the podcast themselves. And so I just generally don't get along with people like that. I'm going to make the podcast the way I want it. It was my idea, so that's what I do. But there always be people out there that want to tell you how to do your podcast, even though they're not going to help you doing it. Moving on. Career. Things to consider, talked about this before. A little bit of this is luck. No different, like I said before, if you wanna become Taylor Swift or NFL quarterback or whatever else, a lot of it does take luck. One in a hundred thousand, maybe even one in a million. I wouldn't say it's like that for podcasting, but probably most podcasts out there, they may make a little money from advertising or Patreon or uh, they're doing something on YouTube or whatever, PayPal or whatever. But most of them don't make any money at all. And a lot of people are just doing this for the fun of it. And that's, that's fine too. 
uh, that's fine too. I think all of this still applies. But for a career, you do uh, need a little bit of luck. Right place, right time. Now in my genre of what we would call true crime, I didn't start till 2016, but really what pushed the true crime genre, true crime has been a thing, you know, people have always been interested in serial killers and, uh, you know, stuff like that, you know, long, long time, 1800s, 1700s. But what made true crime podcasting so uh, big in the last 10 years was a podcast called Serial, which uh, covered the, um, the prosecution of a young man uh, who allegedly killed his girlfriend or his ex-girlfriend. And that just put true crime podcasting on the map, and it's been popular ever since. This is one of those reasons if you're flipping through the TV and you go past like uh, the Oxygen Network or something like that, it's become like the true crime network. This is one of those reasons. Now, the funny thing is, I've never listened to one episode of Serial. Uh, so even though it's in my genre, I've never listened to it. But right place, right time. If you get into something at the right time, who knows how much you can run with it. Of course, um, you know, like no different than a pro athlete or actress. Now, those types of people, though, as you know, probably know a lot of those people have started their own podcast. Well, they already have the advantage that they're already famous. So if they want to start a podcast, uh, maybe even maybe you might think something like what uh, Peyton and Eli Manning would do on Monday nights. They can do that because they've already been famous. They've already been NFL quarterbacks. Whereas you can just get two guys off the street to do something like that, probably nobody's going to watch it. So if you're already famous and start a podcast, that's certainly uh, an advantage. Uh, I was not like that, and I'm still not famous. Are you telling me, is that, is that 10 minutes? All right, just want to make sure of my eyes. Okay. Money can be zero, but there are podcasters, podcasters out there that make millions of dollars. Maybe you've heard of Joe Rogan. He's, I think, the number one paid no matter what you think of him, I'm not really, I don't really listen to him, but I do know that he makes a ton of money doing podcasting. And he was a guy, he was kind of famous, maybe like a B-list, C-list famous person, and now he's an A-list podcaster. Something else you gotta think about if you're gonna make it a career, can you do this for 30 years? At least. Can you do that? Uh, for me, I could have never imagined I would get to episode 300, and already th episode 300 is in the rearview mirror. I don't know, I just don't know where the time has gone. I was thinking, man, if I get to 300, I'll be so lucky, and maybe this is an indication of that. When I started, don't do this. In my podcasting course at Teachable, I talk about this. Don't do this. Really didn't have a lot of confidence in myself when I started in 2016. Had confidence in my writing, had confidence in my, um, you know, my passion for the topic, but really didn't know how far this podcast was going to go, and so I took a lot of shortcuts. And so I had horrible artwork. You know, the logo was something that I, I really just ripped off the internet, and I used that for like a year. I actually ripped off music too. It was copyright music that I was using that technically shouldn't be doing that. So I took all these shortcuts at the beginning, and then like a year and a half in, I still had the same logo and this music, and my podcast was getting popular, and I'm like, boy, these were some big mistakes. So I had to go back to square one. I just create a new logo that was completely my own. There was no copyright on it. And I had to go find my own music. Of course, that kind of changed the entire identity of the podcast a year and a half in. Big mistake, don't do that. But you gotta plan this if you're gonna be around for a while. If you think this is something that you're meant to do, then on day one, I'm gonna be here 30 years from now, so I'm going to prepare now for 30 years from now. Of course, you can't do it part-time like I talked about. Some people have jobs and pursue it on the side, and that's fine too. And there's nothing wrong with doing it for fun. Like I said, in my particular genre, uh, fun, it's not a word, it's the other F word. Uh, that I really don't like to say that because it really, I think, diminishes the work that I'm doing and the seriousness of it. But I do enjoy it when I say that. I enjoy helping these people. I enjoy um, trying to do what I can for these people because a lot of them have just been forgotten when you're talking about 
disappearances that are you know, 30, 40 years old, even the law enforcement officers, some of them weren't even born in that jurisdiction when the disappearance happened. They don't know anything about it. It's, it's very, very sad. It's very sad. So for me to come along, it you know, gives your life meaning. It really does. So my specialty, like I said, is disappearances. And I thought that uh, before I, usually when I'm doing a presentation to uh, criminal justice majors at universities, all I do is speak about disappearances, what I've learned, what the mistakes that are being made, why investigations go, you know, go badly, why are these missing people, you know, still missing. It's like, it's like an hour and a half uh, presentation. Of course, today is more just about podcasting in general. But I thought that before I left, I wanted to give you some tips so you don't go missing. Because I don't want to see any of you uh, on my podcast at some time in the future. And you should know I have covered some disappearances here from Pinellas County. No young people uh, like yourselves, but more, there are a lot of disappearances in this county. Of course, a lot of people live here. A lot of disappearances going way back. So what are some of those ways to keep all of you from going missing? Keep your heads on swivels. I know that's talked about maybe in football, like for receivers who are going, you know, running across the middle of the field. They need to keep their heads on swivels so they don't get their heads taken off. This applies in our everyday lives, too. You need to be aware. What it means is to be aware of your surroundings. Of course, when I was growing up, none of the cell phones and stuff existed. But I do know you get walking on the street, you got your head down, you're talking to somebody, you're look, watching a video and everything. The thing is, somebody could be watching you. You're not watching your surroundings, but somebody could be watching you. This is what happens. You hear about sex trafficking and people, kids being kidnapped. This is how it happens. Even at 13, 14, 15 years old, you have to be aware of your surroundings. This is how it happens. Um, eyes out of your phones while in public. Um, running away, I realize. Um, you know, I've covered some disappearances where young people ran away, never to be seen again. It's, of course, still a thing here in 2023. Running away is not the answer. Whatever you've got going on in your lives, running away is not the answer. It's not. there. You have to seek out help from people who you can trust. Find at least one person you can trust, a teacher, somebody. Don't run away because you're going to hurt your family, and who knows where you're going to end up. Running away is not the answer. Uh, catfishing is real and dangerous uh, for you. It's real. There are disappearances that happen uh, because of it. I will admit that most of the disappearances that I cover are, are of adults, really, between like the ages of like 21 and 50. But I've covered some disappearances uh, under 21. Not as many as maybe other people. There are reasons for that. But catfishing is real and dangerous. People will lie to you to lure you places, and then you'll go missing, and then you'll end up on my podcast. I do not want any of you to end up on my podcast. There's one thing uh, that I want to say to all of you today is don't end up on my podcast. I don't want to see you there. Never hide strangers trying to contact you from the people who care about you the most. You know, I was your age uh, one time, at, at one time, a long, long, long time ago. And yeah, there's things uh, that we don't tell our parents. There are even uh, things, uh, my father's still alive. My mother died a few years ago. My father's still alive. He's 86 years old. I'm 53 years old. There are still things I don't tell. <laughs> so I realize that happens. But at your age, it's probably best off just being transparent the people who care about you the most because that, once again, will keep you from appearing on my podcast. I don't want to see you there. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Okay, there we go. So I guess we've got five minutes left. Any questions uh, before we conclude today? Any questions? Yeah, there we go. I, I, Diane, I can't hear anything. One person, Fred. One person. Uh, yeah, why don't you pass the mic? Yeah, I, I have pretty good ears, but don't, don't ask that. How much you get. Go ahead. Uh, what do you think the salary range of a podcaster is? Uh, the average that, first of all, the average would probably be pretty, pretty low. 
but um, you know, because so many people are making uh, zero. You know, then you, you know, so there are a lot of zeros out there, of course, going to bring the average down. So I'm really not joking, guys. We're being exceptionally rude right now. This is not how we display ourselves as a program, and I'm very disappointed in the number of times I've had to stop you guys from whispering to each other. Stop, listen, and keep your mouth shut. It's not a lot uh, to answer your question. It, it, I, I would... Um, Maybe the average podcaster, I don't know, $20,000 a year or something. You know, if they're doing it full-time, something like that. But that's the average. There are a lot of people who make more than that. Yeah. Go ahead down here uh, in the green. So, oh, or uh, I'll have to go. I guess I have to follow the mic. All right, go ahead. You. Who pays you? Good question. Uh, I get paid from a... <laughs> who pays you? Um, I get paid from a, it's good when you're a podcaster to have a multiple sources of income. Uh, I make money off the ads for my YouTube channel. I get money, I have a Patreon account where I make money there. I, I do some recordings like behind a paywall and some writings behind the paywall. And I also am hooked up with Spotify. Technically I'm in contract with them, although they are not my bosses, that there are ads that are placed in my podcast every Friday, and so I get a cut of those. And you know, with what I do, being that it's seen as a kind of you know helping people out, um, I, I got to be honest. Some people just send me money in PayPal because they think that I'm you know helping these people. I'll just appear there. Hey, there's 20 bucks or 50 bucks in my PayPal account. It, those are the main uh, ways, though, that I get paid. And I've also worked with a, uh, a newspaper in Pittsburgh that paid me as well. Yeah, right, right down uh, here, I think I can yeah, hear you. Yeah, somebody else with the mic. Oh, somebody, oh. Oh, hi. Um, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. Why do you not cover people under 21 that much? Uh, usually, uh, the short answer is, usually when we start getting down to people around your age, it's, it's, it's sometimes hard to find people to trust, to talk to. Um, uh, how do I put this? Usually when you get down to talking about missing people who, you know, maybe we get down to eight years old, 10 years old, 12 years old. This is not me talking, this is the statistics, the studies have been done, like by the FBI. Unfortunately, a lot of kids disappear because of their parents. They have horrible, horrible, horrible parents. And so then that makes it very difficult for me to find somebody who I can talk to, interview for my podcast, who I can trust. Can't talk to the parents because you can't trust them. So that's, uh, that's the short answer. Um, yeah, please. Yes? Um, how do you go about finding the research for your podcast, your episodes? Well, for me, I use, uh, just to start out, I have, I go to two main places, the charlieproject.org, which is a uh, private uh, missing persons database run by my friend Megan. She's been doing that for years. And then the federal government also has a website called uh, NamUs, stands for something, N-A-M-U-S dot gov, and that's the federal database of missing people. So I'll go there. Um, but also, a lot of these families are just out there. They have Facebook pages, et cetera. 